Hi, this is Seth Cohen from the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the University of Washington, and we're going to be talking about gram-negative rods, aka GNRs. The learning objectives are to be able to name medically important gram-negative rods, understand the fundamental concepts in gram-negative rod microbiology, and to describe pathogenic mechanisms involved in common gram-negative rod infections. In this lecture, we will briefly review the microbiology and clinical manifestations of selected medically important gram-negative rods. We've seen a number of gram-negative rods elsewhere in this course. E. coli, Klebsiella, and Proteus are mentioned in the UTI talk. Those first two are also important causes of healthcare-associated infections, as are Serratia and Pseudomonas. Serratia is also discussed in the chronic granulomatous disease talk. Shigella and Salmonella are introduced in the context of diarrheal disease. Haemophilus and Legionella are discussed as causes of community-acquired pneumonia, and all of these bacteria cause a wide variety of clinical syndromes beyond what is mentioned in other talks. But many of the bacteria on the left, particularly the enteric organisms, share a number of clinically relevant pathogenic and clinical factors, which we will discuss over the next few slides. The image on the right is a typical gram stain showing gram-negative rods. The gram stain is a commonly performed test by the microbiology lab that can rapidly differentiate gram-positive bacteria, which are typically blue, from gram-negative bacteria and allow the clinician to begin to target therapy based on this information. While gram-positives have a thicker cell wall that traps the purple component of the gram stain, gram-negative rods have a thin peptidoglycan layer that does not hold on to the gram stain in the same way. We'll discuss this concept in more depth over the next few minutes. As a review, this is a picture of a gram-positive cell wall, which will be contrasted with the gram-negative cell wall on the next slide. So here we see a thick, multi-layer wall, mainly consisting of a rigid peptidoglycan, which gives the cell wall its shape. It's basically like an exoskeleton. This structure is essential for survival, particularly under harsh conditions, like when it's under attack by host immune defenses. Tychoic acid are also found on the cell surface and are important for cell viability and virulence. Lipotychoic acids have fatty acid residues that are important for cell adherence and induce some immune response. They can also act similar to a weakened version of endotoxin, which is an important concept that we will talk about later. This is an awesome picture of a gram-negative cell wall from a scanning electron micrograph. You can see that there is an outer membrane and an inner membrane in contrast to the gram-positive cell wall that we just looked at. This is the cartoon version. Gram-negative cell walls are much more complex than gram-positive cell walls. Since gram-negative cell walls have thinner peptidoglycan layers than gram-positives, they decolorize in the presence of acetone, which is used during the gram stain. Because of this, a counter stain called safranin is added at the end of the gram stain, which gives gram negatives their characteristic pink color. Additionally, gram negatives have a stiff outer membrane that gram positives lack, which is responsible for some of their pathogenesis and antibiotic resistant mechanisms. The outer portion of this membrane contains lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. This is a potent stimulator of the immune system, which can rapidly cause fever, sepsis, and shock particularly when gram-negatives enter the bloodstream. I'm going to say this again to reinforce the translational concept. LPS is a potent stimulator of the immune system. This molecule is also called endotoxin, and again, differentiates gram-negatives from gram-positives. The last thing I want to draw your attention to is a structure in the gram-negative outer membrane called a porin, which allows passage of small molecules, including some antibiotics. Porin mutations are one important mechanism of antibiotic resistance in some gram-negative bacteria. Oh, and did you know that LPS, or endotoxin, is an important stimulator of the immune system? Biofilms are another super interesting and important pathogenic mechanism, though this one is not necessarily limited to gram-negative rods. One important example of this is the bacteria Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas is a notorious bug in the intensive care unit, not only because of its ability to rapidly develop resistance to multiple antibiotics, but also because of its tenacious ability to colonize endotracheal tubes, catheters, and foreign bodies. It does this in part by secreting a polysaccharide biofilm that shields large communities of organisms from antibiotics and the host immune system. Because biofilms are almost impossible to eradicate with antibiotics alone, 
treatment generally requires removal of the foreign body when possible. Pseudomonas is also known for causing difficult to treat respiratory infections in patients with cystic fibrosis. Try to imagine a catheter or even a patient's lungs covered in thick bacterial slime and you'll understand how difficult it is to cure with antibiotics alone. Fimbriae or pili are hair-like structures on the outer membrane of some gram-negatives such as E. coli. They are different from flagella, which are important for chemotaxis or getting around. Instead, these hundreds of hairs are used to adhere either to other bacteria, which have the attractive name as sex pili, or commonly in the setting of E. coli causing UTIs or gonorrhea causing urethritis. You can sort of think of pili like loops on Velcro, ready to adhere to your bladder or urethra if given the chance. Here's a quick reminder of some of the important differences between gram-positive versus gram-negative cell walls. Gram-positives tend to have a thicker cell wall, whereas gram-negatives have a thinner cell wall. LPS, or endotoxin, which is a potent stimulator of the immune system, is common on gram-negatives, but it does not appear on gram-positives. Gram-negatives have an outer membrane, while gram-positives do not. Both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria have biofilms, and gram-negatives have many pili or fimbriae, as opposed to gram-positives, which tend to have few pili or fimbriae. One common way that microbiologists and infectious disease physicians think about gram-negative rods is whether they ferment lactose. This is a quick biochemical test that, in addition to the gram stain, can give us a lot of information about a particular gram-negative rod. Let's break it down a little bit further. Organisms that are lactose fermenters include E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and Citrobacter. Non-lactose fermenters include Pseudomonas, which is oxidase positive, as well as Proteus, Salmonella, and Shigella. Note that these others, Proteus, Salmonella, and Shigella, are oxidase negative. I'm sure you know that there's a lot of biochemical testing that happens in the microlab. I'm only highlighting two very clinically applicable tests oxidase and lactose fermentation that will come up in the course of patient care. Note that Pseudomonas is not the only oxidase positive gram negative rod, but it is probably the most clinically important one to know about. I'm sure you've already memorized this list of lactose fermenters and non-lactose fermenters, but in case you haven't, here they are again on the right with lactose fermenters in blue and non-lactose fermenters in green. All of the bacteria on this table are from the same family of Enterobacteriaceae. Enterobacteriaceae are ubiquitous. They are the largest family of gram-negative rods and the most commonly cultured in the hospital. Many enterics are normal commensals, and they cause opportunistic disease if they migrate outside of normal tissues. Examples of these are E. coli, Klebsiella, and Proteus. As a matter of fact, E. coli is actually non-pathogenic in its normal environment unless it develops certain genetic virulence factors, as mentioned in other lectures, including diarrheal syndromes and the hemolytic uremic syndrome. Enterobacteriaceae are also major causes of UTIs, hospital-acquired pneumonia and bloodstream infections, as well as intra-abdominal infections. Other Enterobacteriaceae, like Shigella and Salmonella typhi, are always pathogenic. There's a lot to know about each bacteria, but I've included a few highlights here. E. coli, which you're now an expert on, is normal gut flora, but can cause UTIs and, with the right genes, can also cause diarrheal syndromes in HUS. Klebsiella is known for being quite mucoid. This just means it looks like thick mucus or snot when it grows on the plate. And it can have a hypermucoviscous phenotype that contributes to its virulence. It's also capable of producing beta-lactamases that confer resistance to antibiotics, even some of the antibiotics of last resort, which is a problem worldwide. Enterobacter and Citrobacter, the Bacter brothers, can also develop multi-drug resistance, particularly in the ICU. Proteus, a non-lactose fermenter, also causes UTIs and produces an enzyme called urease, which can make the urine more alkaline and lead to the formation of a kidney stone called struvite stones. These stones are uncommon clinically, but tend to pop up on exams like step one. Salmonella, which is a truly fascinating bug, you'll just have to trust me on this one, has a number of different strains like Salmonella typhi and paratyphi, which cause the disease typhoid but many other non-typhoidal strains of salmonella cause foodborne illness. Shigella is always pathogenic, in contrast to E. coli, and is not normal gut flora. You remember that Shigella produces shigatoxin. 
Pseudomonas is an important example of a non-enterobacteriaceae gram-negative rod. It's found in the environment in soil, water, plants, but water is really the key habitat to remember. It's referred to admiringly by microbiologists as a water bug because it's often associated with waterborne infections. Pseudomonas also can produce blue-green pigment in cultures, like on the plate shown on the right. And if you're ever bored and you suddenly find yourself in the microbiology lab, if you ask the microbiologist, they'll probably let you sniff a plate of Pseudomonas. And depending on your point of view, it either smells like sweet grape or corn tortilla. I tend to think it smells like corn tortilla, but I'll leave that up to you. Pseudomonas has a number of virulence factors, including exotoxin A, which causes skin necrosis, particularly in intravenous drug users who can inject the bacteria directly into their skin. It also contains LPS, which you'll remember is an important stimulator of the immune response, and many other endo and exotoxins, proteases, and other virulence factors. It contains pili and is an important cause of biofilm formation. Pseudomonas participates in this interesting phenomenon called quorum sensing. Once organisms reach critical mass, they are thought to be able to communicate with each other through this mechanism and help regulate bacterial behavior in response to the host environment. Pseudomonas can infect virtually any organ or part of the body. This is a very short list of some of the more notable clinical manifestations that you may see clinically or on board exams. Impaired host defenses are an important risk factor for this pathogen. Necrotic or poorly perfused tissues in the setting of burns or wounds are one example of this. Neutropenia, or having no white blood cells, is another. Swimmer's ear and malignant otitis are examples of otitis externa. Remember that Pseudomonas loves water and can cause infections in swimmers. Pseudomonas is a notorious cause of diabetic foot infections, particularly because vascular supply can be compromised in diabetics and they often have poor wound healing. Pseudomonas is just one of the many infections that you can contract in a hot tub, depending on the chlorination level of the water or what exactly you're doing in there. Uh, it also causes severe ICU infections, can cause ecthyma gangrenosum, which is a hemorrhagic necrosis of skin, particularly in patients who have neutropenic sepsis. And as previously mentioned, can cause severe infections in intravenous drug users and is associated with biofilms and cystic fibrosis. The last important class of gram-negative rods that we'll talk about and are not discussed elsewhere are anaerobes. Anaerobes are important normal flora at many sites of the body, including the oropharynx, the GI, and the GU tracts. They exhibit incredible diversity, but only a small number of them cause disease. I just don't want to confuse anybody. Keep in mind that gram positives can also be anaerobic. Bacteroides fragilis, which goes by the stage name BFRAG, is the most important anaerobe. Anaerobes can usually be divided up into above the diaphragm anaerobes and below the diaphragm species. Bfrag is exclusively below the diaphragm and typically lives in the large bowel. It has minimal endotoxin, but is often present in polymicrobial infections such as abdominal abscesses that can form after intestinal perforation. Let's talk about above the diaphragm anaerobes. A couple important players include Fusobacterium and Prevotella. There are two common types of Fusobacterium, F. nucleatum and F. necrophorum. These are commonly implicated in deep neck space infections orodental, and pulmonary infections. Lemire syndrome is one testable syndrome and a great diagnosis to make. Patients with this infection are often quite ill due to an infected clot in the jugular vein, classically associated with F. necrophorum. This concludes a whirlwind overview of gram-negative rods, many of which you'll learn about in more depth in other modules. Thanks so much for watching.